introduce Shelby Bissett. She's originally from South Carolina and has a Bachelor of Science degree in biology in, in 2014. Uh, she started her master's in biology later that year at UTRGV and worked on a thesis project looking at dune restoration for the city of SPI. And you all got that in your email today, so I'm sure you've, you've gone over that with a fine tooth comb to quiz her on it. Um, she's currently the program manager at the UTRGV Coastal Studies Lab, where she runs education and outreach and does the Red Tide Ranger and Marine Mammal Response Programs. She's one of our members. Uh, she graduated in the class of 2018 from the RGV chapter of Texas Master Naturalist, and in her spare time, received a second master's degree in public affairs in 2021. When she's not working, she's usually bird banding. She goes on the, the sea turtle ATV patrol and hunts. So with that, welcome Shelby. And she's going to talk to us about uh, coastal ecology and management. Management. Oh, I just, I just stopped. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Well, welcome, Shelby. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to. All right. So tell me some notes here. You make sure this shares correctly. Hmm. It's not going full screen. Give me a second here. Is it full screen for you? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay. All right, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Barb. Um, you know, I've been working on the island uh, since my master's degree, my first master's degree. And so I've got a good background of beach management um, and coastal resources. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an overview of some history of South Padre with a mix of some of my thesis work in that. Um, so just kind of threw this thing together, but uh, so there'll be a different things going on. And I think she also sent you um, my manuscript that was published. It's quite dense, so <laughs> might be a little difficult in some areas, but it'll make more sense uh, once you see these slides. Let's see. Getting a slight delay, so just bear with me. There we go. All right, so South Padre Island history. Uh, the island's known to be about 3,000 to 5,000 years old, depending on which geologist you talk to. Um, but it was first occupied by an Indian tribe known as the, I don't know if I can say this right, but Kaulutikans, maybe. And there's also uh, reports of cannibalistic Kaurabanka Indians, um, but mo they were mostly present near uh, Corpus Christi, but they would have hunting parties then and would explore all the way down um, to South Padre, all the way to the Brazos Santiago Pass. So the uh, Indians were known to only use the islands uh, for hunting, and then they would retreat to the mainland. Um, they were smarter than some of us that develop on islands. Um, <laughs> so Padre Island was first seen and explored by a Spaniard, Alazonzo de Pinada, in 1519. And by the 1920s, uh, Point Isabel ga gains its fame as a sport fishing paradise. And notice the name there, Point Isabel. In 1928, um, the Point Isabel Land Company modernizes and develops the first town site. And that is when they renamed it to be Port Isabel in hopes of having a deep water port. And they marketed it as a building a city where a city belongs. And from the 1928 to 1936 is when those deep water facilities were constructed in the Port of Brownsville, making it an international trade powerhouse. In 1933, a devastating hurricane hits Port Isabel and disrupts life and much of the uh, town goes underwater. And in 1934, our famous TIFT tournaments uh, started, the Texas International Fishing Tournaments, which we still have today. And in 1936, the Brownsville Ship Channel was finished and the Port of Brownsville officially opened. 
and from the 40s through the 60s, 60s um, it was known uh, for shrimping. So that's kind of when the large shrimp industry uh, was started. In 1954 was the first Queen Isabella Causeway, um, which if many of you know, um, Pier 19 restaurant was built on that causeway later on um, and that burned down uh, just last night. Um, so we have lost a piece of history there and also the remaining portion of the old causeway that is attached to Long Island Village uh, is also planned to be um, you know, uh, decommissioned and maybe used for artificial reefs, which ties into Dr. Klein's talk you guys just had. Um, but basically those remnants of that old causeway are, are slowly disappearing. In 1974 is when the new Queen Isabella Causeway opened, the one that we drive on today. So the South Padre Island jetties, uh, when you guys do come visit the, the lab here, we're actually in Isablanca Park down near the jetties. So it's a super awesome place down here at the end of the island. And this was built in 1934 through 36 by railroads. So you see the picture in the top right um, where the railroad uh, ties would go down the, the rocks to deposit those rocks. And you can actually see the pilings where uh, those railroad trusses were. And nowadays we just use them for little seats when we go fishing. Um, so, uh, the only thing about this, but they needed the, the jetties to stabilize the channel because at the time the channel was constantly moving, you know, it's a coastal environment. Um, so they put in the jetties, which was necessary and, and dredged the ship channel to allow for deeper and bigger vessels. But that disrupted the longshore transport of sediment that would naturally come from the Rio Grande. Um, so now that gets trapped on the southern end of the jetties, so on the Boca Chica side. So a lot of that sediment that we need for the island uh, does not make it to the island. Uh, the jetties at Port Mansfield, uh, known as the East Cut, was constructed in 1957. Um, I have a short video. Let's hope this one works out. Do you guys see this web page pop up? Or do you still see my presentation? Still see your presentation. Okay, let me exit out of that presentation mode. So I'm just going to show, let's see, how about now? I might have to I change see, my, my I see sharing. the beginning of your presentation. Okay. Um, you have to share the new window. Yeah, I've got to share a new window, let's see. Share web browser. Whoops, that looks different. This little thing on top is getting in my way. Okay, how about now? Now I see YouTube. Is the bunch okay, of perfect. So I'm going to show um, some aerial views of the jetties in Isablanca Park. To give you all an overview if you haven't been in this area. So that's one of the new pavilions uh, built in 2019. And the drone going up over the dunes, looking into the ship channel and traveling towards Boca Chica. And so now in the park, they've got this boardwalk, which is really nice. And that uh, station sticking out of the water, that's actually a, a weather station that um, tells us tides and temperature of water and things like that. So now it's just looking out towards the channel, We're going to go over the jetties. You can see a lot of recreationists 
out there fishing. Great fishing spot. And for those that want to visit the park, um, you know, outside of your field trip, it's like a $12 entrance. Uh, but when we have the field trip here, we'll, of course, we'll get everyone's names so that they can be uh, entered into the park without having to pay the fee. And the ship channel is about uh, 30 feet deep. And the rest of the bay is only about five feet deep. So you can see how necessary it is to, to have these jetties there to really stabilize this. And you can see a lot of algae growing on the rocks there on the edges. And uh, if you ever wanna see a wild sea turtle not in distress, uh, usually you can see them feeding on the rocks there, the Atlantic greens. But we frequently get calls like, hey, we've got a turtle out here. And we're like, well, is it swimming? <laughs> yeah, okay, is it t tangled in anything? No, all right, well, it, it belongs there. <laughs> so. Question, how long are the jetties? Oh gosh, I didn't look that one up. I would guess a quarter mile. I mean, it's it's a ways out there. Um, even myself, I've only been to the end a couple times. Thanks. Yeah, so they they actually have to go in and, and maintain this as well. The the sand can get sucked out from underneath it so it, it does need a reinforcement from time to time and so the way the waves interact with these uh, rocks is different too um, there can be some wicked currents around there and um, during storms of course surfers love to go to this area and in the channel too. And so straight ahead there, um, kind of the land cuts back. That's known as Dolphin Cove over there near the county's amphitheater. And Dolphin Cove is of course known for dolphins. A lot of feeding happens there. Um, yeah. So the, the jetties right there you're seeing, they're all um, kind of like cemented together. And then once you pass that first section, you can actually see those little uh, stumps where, I'm gonna call them stumps, but they're like pilings where the uh, railroad chests would have gone. But basically the beginning of the jetties has um, concrete and things attaching those rocks. And then when you get further out, there's big gaps in the rocks. And turtles have been found in those gaps. They can get pushed in from a wave. Um, so if you're ever walking out there, look down and Yeah, yeah, so they've had to put that in to reinforce it. So there's beautiful South Padre, that bright blue building on the left, uh, real low on the horizon. That's the Coastal Studies Lab. And the Coastal Studies Lab's been here since 1973, almost at our 50 year mark. All right, I think that's mainly it. Oh, I think it, it'll show a pavilion up close. So I'll wait for that so you guys can see the facilities. So when they built this park, I'll talk about uh, the difference between mitigation and restoration, but anytime anyone builds on the island, uh, if they interrupt any dune ecosystem, they've got to make up for that. And so what you're seeing now is uh, where they've basically built the dunes and, and replanted uh, due to the construction. So they increased the, the dune front uh, in front of that um, to, of course, ha have protection, but also make up for, say, increased parking lot that was built. You have a couple questions. Um, Go ahead. And I one is just says Corps of Engineers. I, I'm assuming they mean is the Corps is the Corps of Engineers the one who built that 
the jetties and, and those type things? The jetties, yeah, that would have been the, as far as I know, the Corps of Engineers. Okay. And then, uh, Robert put in that from the, where the beach, from the beach where the jetty begins to the end of the, out in the Gulf, uh, Gulf North side, it's 0.58 miles. Okay. And another person asked, is it open to the public? And I'm not sure if they mean the, is the Wonka Park? Yeah, Cause that is open to the public or if they mean. Yeah, the, the, the park's uh, open to the public and um, $12 a vehicle. The lab are normally open to the public uh, Monday through Friday, and we're free admission. Um, but we're we're still going through some renovations right now, uh, so I'm just by appointment only right now. Um, but you guys will get your chance to visit, and then hopefully about another month or so uh, we'll be fully open again. So I can definitely uh, let everyone know in the chapter when that occurs. Excellent. All right, are we back on my presentation? Yep. Okay, cool. If I can switch to the next one. Here we go. All right. Um, so a little bit, you know, I was talking about how the sediment is trapped on those jetties on the south side, and that is because we have um, a longshore current that runs from the south pushing north. So I put this up because, um, you know, rip currents happen here. Me, myself, has been caught in one. And if it wasn't for me having this knowledge of these currents, um, you can't actually swim out either way. You can only swim north out of these rip currents on the island. So um, I just share this with whoever and, you know, when your family comes, visits, it's a good thing to pay attention to. Um, you can show them what direction or even it's good to say, hey, go swim further this way because you're going to get pushed. Um, if you're looking at the ocean, you're going to get pushed left, with, which is north. And that's because of a longshore current. So for dune profiles, um, basically what you have, I've got a pre-storm and post-storm or during a storm profile, but you've got your low tide, up to your high tide and that is the difference between your wet and dry beach i call it and at that tidal zone it's also known as a swash zone where you'll get seaweed and other debris washing in and then you'll have a frontal dune and then uh, past that um, you'll have secondary dunes um, and then uh, kind of like a trough but when it levels out for hind dunes, but when a storm happens on the bottom picture here, the water level comes up and they'll hit the dunes. And so if you ever see a dune that looks like straight up and down, we call that a scarp. And that means a wave has come in and, and hit that dune. Um, so that's an erosion escarpment. And um, it's doing its job. That's what's supposed to happen. Those roots of the plants and the dunes actually hold all that sand together and make it really strong. And then, you know, once that storm retreats and we get some good uh, winds come in, then sand will blow against that escarpment and it'll start repairing itself. So here's a mod, well, it's not modified yet, but this is a historic dune profile. This is actually on South Padre. Uh, this is done by one of the scientists, uh, Lennard and Judd. Um, but basically, you've got in that first section, you've got the foreshore. The second section is the backshore. Uh, the third is the windward slope of the primary dune complex. And then the fourth is called the leeward slope, which basically means the backside of the dunes. And then the fifth section, which is actually on the other side of the road, which is actually Highway 100, um, that is the secondary dunes. and those are your, your big dunes. Those are the, the good ones you need up front too. Um, and I'll get, I'll point out kind of the location of the road and, and what that means for the future. Um, and then you get to the vegetated flats and the transitionary zone of that into the tidal flats. 
in the back end of number six. So then I've made a modified dune profile, and this is what it looks like in the city limits. Um, you've got the foreshore and backshore, and then you have what I like to call a vegetated dune field um, because most of the city limits has been planted and restored, and um, they've made a you know 200 feet wide of dune field. Uh, but there is an ordinance in place. It's not uh, required, but if say a hotel, their first floor can't see the ocean, uh, there is an ordinance in place where if the dune is taller than 10 feet um, if, at their expense, they can uh, cut down that dune, relocate the sand, you know, still in the system, but they can uh, basically kind of shave it off the top um, so that they can get that first floor view. So that's uh, an accommodation the city has allowed and, um, you know, it, it, it works out. The, that dune field is uh, very good protection in storms. And then you have the city right behind that. So along with that longshore transport, you know, that pushes from the south to the north, we usually have the southeast wind, you know, 90, 95% of the time, um, except for a north storm like we're getting right now, um, we'll have a prevailing southeast wind from 10 to 20 miles per hour, with the average being 12 miles per hour. Well, we've got a really fine grain sand size, and our sand grains move at 10 miles an hour. So that means sand is always blowing around on this island, unless there's plants that are trapping it. So that's why the vegetation in the dunes is really important, because that's going to stop that sand and that sand's going to fall down and, and help that dune grow. So next is Barrier Island. So with the Barrier Island, all up Texas, we have Barrier Islands. And the overall theme of Barrier Islands is that they migrate towards the mainland. Um, and so you'll call this uh, Barrier Island rollover. You can see in the picture on the right, uh, that's not that's not here. I think that's actually in New Jersey. but um, you can see where they've got some jetties, and then that other section of their island has definitely moved westward or towards the mainland. Um, so you also see in the left diagram in the middle there is what's called an overwash fan. So if anyone's familiar with South Padre uh, last year, I think it was last year, um, about mile 19 on the north end, was a big overwash and that's a historic overwash that has happened you know decades ago and we just had a, a bad storm hit up there and and it was impossible to cross uh, for several weeks due to that overwash but basically when that overwash comes in all that sediment gets pushed to the back of the island uh, furthering that rollover effect the rest of that sand if it's not pushed by storms and waves it's getting blown out um, so it's going to blow into the bay uh, and also onto the mainland. And so I've got an example of where it's blown on the mainland. This is up near Port Mansfield. I was fortunate enough to go on El Sal's ranch a couple weeks ago. And here on the left side, you can see these sand dunes, these deposits. Um, they've been there. I looked back in the imagery for 50 years and, and they were still there. So. Here's 1985, there's even more of them at that time. So I'm sure vegetation has grown over them in the last uh, 40 or so years. Um, but all that is South Padre Island sand. And you can see on the island, the barrier island there, it's very bare, there's no vegetation. And I believe that's probably due to Hurricane Allen in 1980. Um, so the island probably took a big hit, that was a category five and a lot of that sand could have blown onto the mainland there. And you can also see the east cut there where the, it's a, a smaller ship channel is not quite as deep as our uh, Port of Brownsville. And here's just some pictures from the El Sal's ranch on those dunes. Uh, it reminds me of the north end of South Padre. They're huge dunes, you know, 30, 40 feet tall. Um, but I noticed the sand was even softer there, it seemed to be even be more of fine material. 
So that brings me to the dunes here surrounding the coastal studies lab. Um, so the coastal studies lab actually has four acres of dunes around it. We're on a, a leased property that's on something like a 200 year lease, uh, you know, written back in the 70s. So that's really nice. Um, what I want to point out, these two sections I've circled in yellow. So the one on top is the most recent parking lot that's put in. They've actually doubled that parking lot. Um, so there's another section just to the north of that same size. But the section over here on the just below the Coastal Studies Lab uh, was a huge dune. It was about 20 feet tall. And uh, we lost that due to the mitigation needed for the park. Um, so, like I said, if, if you impact dunes like that huge parking lot, they've got to make up for that um, when they write these permits. And so if they needed to put sand and plants in front of their construction areas. And uh, I guess they decided to take some from us, um, which led me to wonder, you know, how did we get these dunes? And so I went back in the imagery years after this happened. I should have looked back then, but I'll go back in time here. 2017, this is before they took the dune out and before the parking lot and things. So you can see those same sections pretty much fully vegetated. And you can even see the elevation. This is just Google Earth and you can see that elevated dune sticking out. But I noticed as I went back in time that the dune was more bare. I saw more sand as I went in time. So as a biologist, I recognize that that means the plant community is going through secession. Um, so that means it's it's increasing its diversity. More species are coming in. It's repairing itself or building itself. So you keep going back in time and that bare spot just gets bigger and bigger. The sand is still there. It's still lots of sand. You can still see some of that elevation. And so as this goes back in time, I realize this looks like a washover. So this is how the sand got here. The sand, the, a storm would have pushed it straight up over that parking area right next to the Coastal Studies Lab, which remember is built in 1973 and Hurricane Allen came in 1980. So my belief is that this sand was deposited here in 1980 with Hurricane Allen. So here's 2002, it is almost completely bare. And of course, imagery is getting worse as we go back in time, but I hope you guys get the idea behind it. Uh, so that's 1995. And then this is prior to the lab being built in 1962. Uh, so the park looked much different than, you know, all bare beaches. And then, uh, you know, here we've got some dunes forming next to the road and all that sand deposited around the Coastal Studies Lab. And then it just starts repairing itself as we go forward in time. Plants just growing in naturally on their own. Until we get to 2017, it's almost perfect up until that basically gets mowed down. So that, that was heartbreaking for me, uh, but a fight I could not fight. <laughs> so I'll just keep going forward here. So coastal dunes, they're structurally more complex than beaches. They provide animals with a diversity of microclimates and habitat. And there's a stress gradient of salt spray and wind. So basically there's certain plants at the front of the dune that are able to survive and they're very hardy and tolerant. And then as you get to the back of the dune, you're gonna find more species uh, that you might not see in the front because they're less tolerant to those salt spray and wind. But of course provides ecosystem services to our nearby urban areas, protects us from erosion, storms and hurricanes. Coastal flooding is a big concern uh, with sea level rise happening. This was just a map I got from NOAA showing a lot of flooding happening on the back end, all those tidal flats, of course, on a big storm. Um, those things will 
become inundated with water, but you see this all the way through the mainland and then even a thin strip on the beach front. Uh, Laguna Vista, oh. Laguna Vista get pretty wet too. <laughs> so if you guys ever want to play with that stuff, you can just, you know, Google NOAA flood map and uh, you can see what's going on with your neighborhood. <laughs> so speaking of neighborhoods, uh, a lot of people wonder where their land is going because it's being washed away by the sea. Uh, here is the end of the road of South Padre. And these are parcels of land uh, in kind of reddish orange. So the beachfront properties, these were drawn out mostly in the 70s. And our erosion rate, I'll show that next, our erosion rate is anywhere between 10 and 20 feet of loss per year. And so these parcels that were drawn out uh, 60 years ago, they've lost more than half their land uh, due to the ocean. And because of setback lines, which setback lines are basically where you can build uh, in regard to the tidal line. So um, they say, you know, 200 feet from the high tide zone is where someone could build a home or, or whatever it may be. And so the story here is that the beachfront properties are basically not developable. The new beachfront is on the other side of the road. So you see the road there, and you see how much land has been lost. Um, when we talk about building the new bridge, the, one of the reasons that has not happened is because of the heavy erosion. Original plans had the new bridge landing on that road. Well, if we spent all this money and built that bridge to end on that road, in 20 to 30 years, the ocean will be right there at that road. Um, so in order to bring that in, they're gonna have to create a new road or kind of move that road towards the west back more into those wetland um, back dune areas. So that's kind of the history with that. Um, it might be a little hard to see, but some of these parcels of land, like the one on the bottom here, uh, a lot of these pieces have now been picked up by conservation organizations. That one on the end is called Coastal Bend and Base Estuaries. So they've got some acreage as well as Laguna Atascosa Wildlife Refuge and Sea Turtle Inc. Uh, so that's very good. It's gonna help us um, keep the pristine nature of the north end of South Padre. And so that's just the area of loss there for those landowners circled in yellow. Uh, these are just the shoreline erosion rates. So I basically said this, um, but if you're looking in the blue areas, the blue areas is basically where the city is and that's where management occurs. So with the help of nourishments where they pump sand onto the beach and planting the dunes, we're able to more or less stabilize the erosion and, and keep that at bay. But once you pass the city limits, going up towards the north end, the erosion rate um, goes from three meters up to five meters. So you're talking 20 plus feet of loss per year. And uh, like I said, that's partly due to the sediment not being able to get past those jetties. If you look right at the top of that image where it says Mansfield Pass, there's a little hint of blue. And so the same thing is happening there where the sediment gets trapped on the south side of those jetties. These images are of the South Padre city limits. Uh, the here on the left just shows uh, what they've done with the dune field. And, and these pictures don't even do justice. Um, the top one is from 2007 and 2007 was the year they started their coastal management program. And then the bottom section is 2012. And most of that growth happened with uh, pushing seaweed into the dunes and also some plantings. And on the right side, um, you've got a couple lines there. So in red is where the dune protection line should be. So everything from the red line forward should be, or towards the ocean should be dunes. But you can see there's lots of buildings in front of that line. And so 
much of this town was built in the 80s after Hurricane Allen. So all the dunes were decimated in that storm. And you know that was prior to a lot of this knowledge we talk about now. Um, so the historical building line is there in green. So that's where they allowed building in the past. But really, now that we know more, everything should be built behind that red line. So beach maintenance, there's that sargasm seaweed. We see a lot here. And what they do is actually push that into the sand dunes and that helps them grow. It helps trap more sand and uh, it really helps the plants because as that decomposes, a lot of nutrients go in the sand when sand is normally just you know no nutrients, very little. This is an image of a, uh, a nourishment, also known as beneficial use of dredge material. Uh, so they, the city organizes this with the Army Corps of Engineers. Every two to three years, they have to pump that Bra Brazos Santiago Pass at the ship channel in order to keep it deep enough for those big ships. And uh, they'll put that here on the beach, usually around Clayton's. Uh, that's where an erosion hotspot is. And so sometimes they do that with straight pipes from the channel all the way to the spot. Uh, but in the past couple of years, they've been using uh, hopper dredges where they pump it from offshore onto the shore. And this just shows some of the money they've spent. Uh, they've been doing this for several decades. And the city's been, you know, the, the big one getting the sand, which time to time uh, the county has received some sand in here in Isablanca Park. The other problem is trash. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but the city uses a, a new truck that actually sweeps up the trash and um, it is very minimal impact to the beach. Um, so they do a real good job. They have great bins. They've got their rules posted everywhere. They've got code enforcement. So they do a lot uh, to keep the beaches clean here in the city, um, but it's a different story on the north end and on Boca Chica. This is going back into my thesis days. Um, so when I started, we were doing a lot of plantings, but the plantings actually started in 2008. Um, they actually were doing it with shovels and volunteers. So they were pretty slow. They were only doing 1,500 plants at the time. But once 2010 hit, they were able to get a lot of money and uh, they were doing several volunteer events per year and they would plant about 10,000 to 13,000 plants in a you know just a morning you know a couple hours a dozen volunteers with drills uh, would put these plants in the ground and they averaged about 100,000 plants per year and now the dunes are so full and luscious that they actually don't host these events anymore because it's not that necessary uh, they will fill in patches here and there, um, but they haven't had a big event, which is sad because I really enjoyed it, but um, maybe one day they'll continue to do plantings. And this was some of the plantings I was a part of in 2015 as a student. So the one on top is in April. That's like how we would prep the area. Um, and then the one on the bottom was a different section and that was in January of the same year. And that's just after we planted. So those, uh, Plants are only about eight months old out of the greenhouse. Uh, sea oats and bitter panicum is what we would use. And these are just, you know, six months, eight months later. Um, in 2015, same year, we can see how much has grown in less than a year. So they really take off quick with the help of those plants. So I also looked at, um, well, first the plants, like I mentioned, I looked at the communities, what species are there. I took sediment cores uh, and, and burned the sand in the fancy burner, basically to find out that there's not much nutrients there. Uh, but uh, then I looked at the animals, uh, which is really fun. I'll show you the trap setup that I used. And then I looked at the dune heights and volumes. Oh, and that picture in the middle, that's me holding a little baby possum. I found all kinds of things, even cats, like a stray cat once. Uh, but here's a setup of the dune system. 
Uh, so this was interesting because a, a lot of homeowners were wondering what the heck is going on out there in the dunes. You know, you can't do that. Uh, but, you know, once I explained what was going on, you know, everyone was really intrigued and interested to find what critters were there. And basically the way that would work is an animal would hit that black fence and go to the trap in the middle and also along that black fence were five gallon buckets buried in the ground. Um, so things like lizards would fall into those. Dune heights and volumes, that's a lot of scientists uh, mumbo jumbo there, but basically looking at a LIDAR imagery uh, to see the dune heights over the different times. And it was in fact, so the plots I looked at of restoration aged from two years old to five years old. And then my control areas were areas that were known to never be planted. Um, so of course you can see the trend and height going up over the age and the control was much different in height. If I were to redo this, I would have included uh, some of those dunes from the north end because that would really increase this graph up um, because those go up five meters plus. Here's just a few of the plants. Uh, I identified, I think, 36 species and uh, there's a, a picture of all those different species in the the paper that you were emailed. Uh, but these are the initial colonizers. So these are the first ones to show up. These are salt tolerant. Um, the beach tea is on the left. Sea purse lane is the next one. That one's more like a succulent. You can actually eat that one. I wouldn't eat too much of it. It's really salty. But when I have kids out here, I, I usually take a nibble on that and they freak out, but <laughs> they like it. The next one is uh, woolly titostromia. Uh, railroad vine, another one you'll see that's a vine is Beach Morning Glory, and that has a white flower. And those vines are really the first ones that creep out and start trying to expand the dunes. And if we don't walk there or drive there, um, it will start building the dune that way. And Camphor Daisy is the next one. So some of the dune animals uh, found several different lizards, some crabs, I mean, down to crabs that were just a centimeter large. Those are ghost crabs in that picture. Um, the lizard, real colorful one is a, I think that's a six lined race runner. And then the other one here in the palm of the hand is a keeled earless lizard. I also caught a species of snake called a coach whip. Um, there is known to be rattlesnakes on the island, but I did not catch any in the city limits, which everyone loves to hear that little fact. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying you'll never come across one, but the chances are, are more slim. And then the uh, Mexican spotted ground squirrel, those are real fun. Those things are going through behavior change because if you're out here during tourist season, they will come out of the dune and go steal people's Doritos or whatever it is and run back into the dune. So it's pretty funny to watch them. And then we've got the uh, black land crab there on the right. So I, in the dunes, I'd have black land crab and ghost crab, but there's also a blue land crab that you'll see more on the bay side of the island and in the town limits. Here's just a list of all those species for the mammals. Several of those mammals are actually invasive. Um, the Mexican spotted ground squirrel is native, uh, but the rest of those, I think the harvest mouse is native, native but house mouse and black rat, um, those are known to come in with development. You know, I don't know if they travel in on trucks when they bring in wood or whatever it may be, but that's, that's how those get here. The reptiles and amphibians, we had that coach whip snake, the so Rio Grande tripping frog, six lined race runner, killed earless lizard, and the lesser earless lizard. And one really cool snake that looks like an earthworm, it's called the Texas blind snake, a brown anole, four lined skink, and then the two crustaceans there, black land crab and ghost crab. I also surveyed for insects. Um, insect ID is incredibly hard, uh, so I just, identified it to the families. You can just see there's lots of families of insects here. And basically there was no difference in the different ages of plots, meaning that insects are going everywhere and doing what they need to do. 
uh, which is good to hear because we need them to pollinate everything, even new plants. Um, so that's good there. So for some coastal management tactics, I just broke it down between the city and county because that's who runs this island. Um, so the city of South Padre, they manage from Isla Blanca up to the shores, which is about five miles of beach. And then the county has kind of pockets in between there because they've got Isla Blanca Park, Andy Bowie, and then the northern boundaries of the island up to mile 13, where it becomes Willacy County. So for the city, they have a continuous restoration and dune plantings. Uh, and they use low impact beach equipment. They actually reduce their raking. They will leave the rack line, meaning in an off season, they're gonna leave that seaweed there. You know, the birds and all the other species that need to feed off of it. And we want those nutrients staying in the system. Um, if it gets too much, or if we've got a lot of tourists coming in, that's when they will push that seaweed into the dunes. Um, they've got lot, lots of rules and ordinances and they enforce them. And so that's a big part of that. No driving. The no driving thing, um, driving in Texas is part of the Texas Open Beaches Act. So that is something Texas is special for and it's gonna be basically impossible to get rid of, but it definitely needs to be managed in certain areas. And so in a town, they're able to uh, limit that and uh, create an ordinance not allowing that only by permit. They also have the continuous nourishments where they pump onto the beach, the sand onto the beach. And so I'd say that they're shoreline conscious, they're backing practices with science. And, and that's why they had me as a student um, intern back in 2014 through 2016. And they've really grown their program. They've got, you know, GPS units that cost more than my car. Um, and so those things will tell you, you know, anything down to the centimeter of, of how things are growing. They can you know, measure the vegetation lines and tide lines and things like that. So the city is known uh, to be a model for coastal management in Texas, the city of South Padre. So we're really fortunate to have them. And the county is is working. They're They're doing better, but they still got some kind of old techniques. Um, they're using graders and front loaders on the beach. So if you ever go in, you know, in the winter time, access six, it's loaded down with sand. Most people are getting stuck. But as soon as tourism season hits, they actually take a grader and they just mow that down, make it real flat. Well, the flatter you make it, and the more you run those heavy equipment on it, the more that erodes basically dropping the level of the beach and also making that sand pick up and blow away. And then of course there's heavy four by four driving use. Um, you know, it's one thing for these people driving speed limit and just going fishing, but it's a whole nother when we have Jeep crews and everything else doing donuts and driving in the dunes, which that's, that's illegal, but there's, you know, little enforcement of that. So, like I said, up there, there's no dune protection. I mean, yeah, it's written in the law, but it's not really happening. And there's no plantings other than, you know, requirements by mitigation because of park improvements. So you don't see them planting just because they know they need to plant. Um, they're only doing it because they have to. And then there's occasional nourishments um, if they're able to get a piece of the pie per se um, when they're dredging that ship channel. That leads me to Boca Chica Beach and South Bay. Uh, you see South Bay just right behind SpaceX there. So that's the SpaceX launch pad in Boca Chica. So Boca Chica is an important sea turtle nesting habitat for the Kemp's Ridley, as well as the North End. Occasionally there's nesters in the city, um, but you know, 90% of your turtles are on the north end, you know, I, I know they can see the, the town. I mean, <laughs> they've got pretty good eyes and they, they can look above the water. Um, and I, I patrol for sea turtles and they, I've even known, uh, you know, on access five and six, people are out there, you know, just tailgating car by car. And I've heard of someone say, hey, I was fishing and, I, you know, I caught a sea turtle, but, it, you know, let go or whatever it was. and I said, you know, that turtle probably turned back around and just kept going north. You know, they 
they don't want to nest in all those people. Uh, they will in a pinch, but they know to move on and they can hold on for a few days and find the right spot for themselves. Uh, so th the rest of that area around SpaceX is actually the lower Rio Grande National Wildlife Refuge. And there's 10,000 acres there. Um, so if you hear any pushback against SpaceX, and uh, that's partly the reason why it's a pristine uh, nesting grounds for birds um, like the piping plover. Um, so there's a lot of great habitat that's being impacted and just the amount of traffic happening on that road and, and road kills of wildlife is just, you know, 200 times what it used to be. Um, so, of course, it's the Starbase site and launch pad. I like to go see it. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's one of those like love hate things, I guess. It's kind of exciting, but you also cringe at the same time. Um, there's lots of trash and pollution from the Rio Grande River. So one of the things we do here at our lab is we're part of the Beach Watch program where we test bacteria in the water and make sure it's safe to swim. And we have the cleanest water in Texas. You know, I see all the updates every week and we're just always in the green, you know, reporting zeros, except uh, from time to time during a big rain event in the valley, um, the, the counts will be higher on Boca Chica, just coming right there out of the river, the salinity will drop and then the bacteria will increase as well as the trash. Um, I would say there's even less management and enforcement on Boca Chica. I've been here several years and I've only seen a federal warden on that beach once. Um, again, the jetties trap the longshore sediments on that Boca Chica beach, but also the seashells. So if you ever want to find sand dollars, that's the best place to go, which you got to go really early in the morning and beat all the shellers. And there's large dunes there, uh, but there's also signs of degradation. Uh, ATVs have torn those things up and also walking trails. Some of the unique attributes, um, definitely try to visit there if you ever get a chance, but go during low tide. Um, you can visit the mouth of the Rio Grande, uh, Mexico. Well, you can see Mexico from that side. Um, you can see there's historical sites along the lower Rio Grande refuge. You can stop and read those signs. You can visit or see SpaceX, take pictures. And you can uh, see actually the end of the border wall uh, just stops right near the checkpoint. So if you ever, you know, never seen a section of the wall, it's kind of interesting. It just ends right there. Uh, South Bay is super shallow, but pristine fishing. Um, there's no beachfront development and there's great shelling on that beach. So the Laguna Madre, I know you guys just heard from Dr. Klein, so he probably fished y'all out. But um, it's a hypersaline bay. Uh, there's basically like a forest of seagrass there. It's a unique ecosystem and sanctuary for other species. Um, fresh water comes in from the Arroyo Colorado and it's influenced by tides through the Brazos Santiago Pass and the Port Mansfield Cut. And interesting, uh, TPWD recently passed legislation to allow for oyster mariculture. So if you're out on the bay and you start seeing things uh, like these cages, these baskets here on the left top corners, um, that's where people are basically farming oysters, they're growing them. And that's a pretty good practice because our native reefs um, are not doing as well. And the old practices of trawling for oysters just really mow down those reefs and don't really give them a chance to, to grow back. So um, that Mary culture is really good thing coming to this state. We're the last Gulf state to allow for that. Um, so hopefully we'll be getting cheaper oysters in our restaurants. And on the bottom right, that's just some seagrass there, and that's a boat scar. So that's one of the educational pieces is for any of our boaters out there, recreation, recreation of that. You know, it's really shallow. If you don't know how to use your boat and motor and things, you can easily create a scar. Um, one of our students here some years ago studied those scars and found that it takes up to eight years for that to repair. Um, so anytime that seagrass gets mowed down, that releases carbon that it's storing. Um, so just like cutting down the rainforest, um, that's leading to 
more carbon into the atmosphere. So some of the aquatic species in the bay, this is a few, this is a highlight of the food chain. There is our shrimp in the uh, left-hand top corner. Uh, Atlantic green sea turtle, they're gonna be in the bay and the, the Kemp's Ridley will nest on the beach front. Bottlenose dolphin, um, there's a burrfish. Some people think that's a puffer. He will puff up, but he's known as a burrfish. And then there's our beloved manatee. So I've been following this manatee for several months. It, it passed away a few weeks ago, um, but we're seeing more rare sightings uh, of these kind of things and, and different animals are kind of migrating into our area. As far as our bay goes in the ecosystem, that manatee, you know, has most of everything that it needs. Um, it can munch out on that seagrass, but the really limiting factor is that we do get too cold in the winter. Uh, we get sustained, you know, continually cold fronts every weekend, like it's been, um, then our water temperature drops. We were really warm in the water through December, and then January it started dropping, um, and then this February that manatee died. Um, so it's most likely due to cold stress is why that passed away. Um, I do do necropsies on dolphins, so if any of them wash dead, um, but for whatever reason, I mean, that manatee was really decomposed, but I did not get the go ahead to necropsy it. I would have, it would have been nasty, but <laughs> I would have done it. So, you know, I, I can't really say for sure because we couldn't really do the science behind it. Um, but based on, you know, images and water temperatures and things, it's most likely due to cold stress. So what's this mean for the future of shorelines on South Padre? Erosion will continue and so will development. Shoreline management is critical for the North End and the county should basically mimic what the city's doing. Uh, the rest of the state coastal towns are trying to do so as well. Warmer water temps, air temps, and anthropogenic, which basically means human impacts like development, uh, will lead to more changes in species migrations um, in the water and on the sky. So we might have birds coming in um, and, and like the manatee showing up. Fisheries uh, will not be able to sustain population growth and human consumption. Uh, if you are a fisherman, you notice the TPWD is frequently changing numbers on how many things you can take per species. Um, and that is because, you know, we're, we're stressing our fisheries out and some, some for some species. Um, so that's where aquaculture and mariculture uh, will become critical to help feed us. Uh, so some traditional techniques are harsh on the habitat, like the oyster trawling. So we need to manage inland pollution. So this is things that all of us can contribute to and educate others. How everyone in the Rio Grande here, all the runoff will come out here to the coast, whether it's coming out of the Arroyo, Colorado or the Rio Grande River. Um, if we pollute this bay, we're gonna lose an incredible resource. Uh, so we've really got to do what we can to steward and take care of that. Two take home points uh, due to the jetties and sea level rise, SPI is an overall heavily eroding beach with some areas of stabilization due to management, management practices like in the city limits. Uh, we have high winds and fine grain sand, so that means it's constantly moving and it's important to trap that sand here on the island with dune vegetation or even sand fencing will help that. Most of this sand can blow into the bay and onto the mainland like we see, saw on the El South Ranch. And much of the town was built after Hurricane Allen in 1980 and prior to coastal management practices. So we're gonna continually uh, have to fight that fight um, because of that uh, unfortunate uh, development happened that way unknowingly. Um, and South Padre is the largest developable barrier island in the nation. So the national seashore is um, larger, has more miles, of a beach, uh, but it's protected by the park service, of course. But as you saw, I showed you all those parcels of land and we've got talks of bridges and moving roads. 
um, it will happen that development will come on South Padre. It's a dynamic and diverse ecosystem and warmer temps will elicit new visitors like our beloved manatee. So that's all I've got. Is there any questions? Anybody got any questions? Well, there was one question, um, probably about the manatee. So, would it come up into the Arroyo, Colorado, when it got too cold, or or would that be too far? It could. Um, so, a little backstory on this manatee: it went full circle. This manatee, I first got the call. I don't know, October, or November, and. Uh, we were only an hour away from the report, which that's the least amount of time I've had on any of the reports. And it was found in Laguna Vista. I had a volunteer go out within an hour and the thing was already gone. Um, so that's where it was initially sighted. And then from then on, it was a chase. Um, but for us, it was chasing Facebook posts, which was incredibly frustrating because we would see you know, videos of the manatee over on South Padre at someone's dock, um, but we'd find it a day later on the concierge page. Um, you know, same thing with up near Port Mansfield and the Arroyo. It was moving all over the bay over the last three or four months. And the last time I physically chased it, uh, Tony actually helped with this because it was way up in the Brownsville Ship Channel. And really the only way you could get to it was by a kayak. Uh, we took our boat as far as we could and we went to this cutout and this uh, floodway, I guess you could call it, actually goes under Highway 48. And uh, Tony found out that basically Rancho Viejo drains into this waterway and it cuts all the way down into the ship channel. So I don't know how far that manatee went up that waterway, but I figure it was pretty shallow and pretty warm uh, for December. That was when we were searching for it then. So the last time uh, there was a good report on it and then it was found deceased back in Laguna Vista this month. So it's it really amazing all the places it went uh, and then kind of returned back to where we first had the first sighting. Um, so, you know, just reporting of those is, is really key and getting, you know, yeah, make your Facebook post, but <laughs> call the authorities first, uh, just because the delay from posting things on Facebook and by the time, you know, all of us are working in our jobs um, and we're not, you know, we're not on the pages all day long. So, um, and you guys can help you know, that too, if, if you see things and and uh, you think that maybe the report hasn't come in, it doesn't hurt to call. Um, the reports are supposed to go to 1-800-9-MAMMAL, uh, which is the stranding network in Galveston. Uh, but Monday through Friday, you guys call the lab and really that's gonna, that message is gonna get to me faster. Um, uh, it's unfortunate on the weekends, I don't really have a, a line that will reach me. So another way to do that, which has worked pretty well is people have called the emergency line for Sea Turtle Inc. and they will text me right away. So um, that's an option for the weekend. So I, I wish my job would give me an emergency phone because <laughs> I don't want to hand out my cell phone just to all the public. But, um, you know, that's how Sea Turtle Inc. are able to manage their emergencies. Any other questions? Yeah, there's some other questions. Um, where did the manatee come from? Uh, so uh, my guess is Mexico. There is uh, populations down in Mexico. There is a chance it could have come from Florida. Um, they're really struggling in Florida. The habitats are, are degrading, um, but most likely that one traveled up from Mexico, but who knows, you know, we don't have trackers on these things and if you ever look up how to track a manatee, it's really hard. The, the trackers don't stick to them well. I mean, they're just a round, big body, and they actually have little hairs on them. So that really inhibits uh, any type of suction that you would use for a tracker. 
okay, another person asked, uh, how do we get the county on board with uh, more modern conservation practices? Um, you can, uh, you know, go to the county meetings, the commissioner's court. They do have a, like a shoreline team now, um, and they're they're doing better things. But um, you know, it just, I I don't know what it is. I really don't. It it's uh, it's not rocket science. Like we already kind of know the equipment we should be using, and you know, they bought a giant. I don't know what you call it, some type of front loader, and they actually had like a ribbon cut and cutting for it and things like and had the priest come out and bless this huge piece of equipment. Um, so, you know, that that kind of thing is just a, a little strange because I mean, I'm sure they use it for other parts of the park that, that may be nece necessary, but uh, those things don't belong on the beach. Um, and there's better ways to to clean the beach and, and get the sargasm off and and make it easier to drive. So, is uh, are there any kinds of opportunities for volunteering that has anything to do with the beach or dunes? Hmm. Well. The occasional planting does happen. Um, I will be doing a planting. Here in the next few months, because we're repairing our walkway out front of our building and we're expanding our deck. So, because we're expanding our deck, um, it is impacting some of the dune vegetation. So, I am going to have a small planting. It's only going to be about 1200 plants. Um, but, I, of course, we'll be inviting the master naturalists out for that. Um, beach cleanups is an easy one. Follow those. They, various organizations put those on. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I'm not really sure of all the different things going on. You can always, uh, contact the city and say, hey, you know, I'm a volunteer. You know, I, I like plants or whatever it is and see if they would take the bait. Um, I'm not sure if they allow for that, but it's worth a shot. And then, yeah, if you want to be an advocate and, and try to talk to the different management teams and and make sure that they're doing good practices that's another way but you will let us know about uh, when you're wanting to do your planting yep i sure will excellent um, somebody asked uh, or said manatees are on the threatened list what kind of protection does that give them uh threatened but well, i don't know i mean if you do something to them, <laughs> you can get <laughs> fined bigger that way. Uh, you know, boat strikes them and ha person happens to get caught or something like that. Um, yeah, or if, you know, things like illegal fishing that occurs, they can get trapped in gill nets and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure other than fines. Um, let's see. I was just reading this this uh, comment. Oh, really? There's a, a picture of 1910 manatee comes to Point Isabel. I yeah, I'd like to see that postcard. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's been known that we have a few sightings here and there, and you know, I expect to see more in the future. Um, so we just, I don't know. Do we hope for the bay to get warmer so we can have manatees? I'm not sure. I don't know what the the right answer is there. But um, yeah, it is, it is cool that we get the occasional visitor. Other questions or comments or anything for Shelby? Lots of comments that the presentation was great. Thank you. It was interesting to hear about how you did your research too. Yep, I've come a long way. I used to be just a tourist as well. I, I didn't know anything other than sitting my butt in the sand and drinking a cold one uh, <laughs> until I went into my master's degree. <laughs> so, so now you are a scientist. Is that is that what you're saying? 
I guess you want to call me that. <laughs> but now I I can't walk out there without looking at everything and every plant, and I can even hear the calls of the ground squirrel because when I trap them, you know, of course I'd pick them up and they would scream. Um, so now I I can hear like their little bark that they do. Uh, so it's really made me in tune and. I like to tell people that, you know, when you're walking over a walk over to the beach, you know, look around you. Don't just stare at the water. I mean, there's a lot of diversity and awesome plants and flowers uh, happening there. Well, I was going to comment last year, Robert and I did the walking tur turtle patrol and our, we were in zone four. It was down by Clayton's. And so we were there when they started moving all that big equipment in. We were like, what the heck are they doing? And then um, we'd have to walk around one way. And, you know, we it was all during when they were doing that, that restoration. And um, we were like, just like you said, a turtle would have to be crazy to come up here, right, in, you know, in, in amongst all this to lay their eggs. They have to be desperate, I guess, not crazy, desperate, because yeah. um, we, so we never saw any uh, evidence of any turtles, but it, it was, it was interesting to, to see the, the restoration and how it progressed and what it, because we could, you know, like we had to walk around that, um, where that, where the pier is that they built the Clayton's and it was like around, and then all of a sudden, then the beach was way out there uh, at, well, not all of a sudden, but after, after it was restored. So that was interesting to sort of be in the middle of. Yeah, it got really wide and it did, uh, you know, tear down over several months after that. But the, the theory is, is that that sand will stay in the system. It'll stay in the sandbars and then it'll come back onto the island uh, with waves. Um, so yeah, it's a, a drastic, thing you see at first and then you might see it go away and get real disappointing. But um, the hope is that the sand stays in the system. And they're also hoping that Clayton's Pier uh, will trap some sediment too. So um, it will be extended. Um, they only built, you know, one portion of it, but it will go out into the water and it's gonna be interesting to see how the, the sand will settle around that. And I did meet because I was doing the ATV patrol then and they had a protected species observer on the beach. So he was sitting in one of those uh, Kubotas or, you know, something like that. And and that's what they're there for is watching for, you know, if sea turtles would come in. So that that was, you know, reassuring that that they had one of those guys out there. That's good to know. There were a lot of people that that were with that project that were out there. Um, so that's good to know that they had somebody looking for that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Shelby. I have one question and for you and Tony, what would you think about, would it be possible for us to push our trip back to the 12th of March? I'd have to go look at my calendar real fast, but that's very possible. Okay. 12th of March. Oh, wait. Well, we, I have a, we, we um, can I workshop that day, but it oh, you depends do? on the time. Yeah, we could do it in the afternoon. Well, we we'll we'll touch base with you because it it doesn't, uh, you know, the the workshop work, work going out there with you and out on the beach and trying to collect things is is fun. If the weather is like hor horrible, it won't be fun. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be you know. 55 is cold for me. It's gonna that wind will go right through you. Yeah, and and uh, well, I've got the 12th open, Shelby. And you know, if you give your presentation tomorrow and they can't go to the beach, I can take them to the beach on the 12th. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and I've got multiple rooms, so um, you know, if Tony led that, I can just make sure to have y'all a space here. Okay, well, we will we'll 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 figure it out and uh, let the class know what what we what gets decided. How's that? Sounds good. Well, thank you for your time, Shelby. All right, thank Excellent you all. Talk, good luck with the rest Great of your time. classes. <laughs>
Thank you, and, and we loved your presentation. So I just have a few announcements for the class. Um, you guys stay on here. We'll let Shelby go. And uh, thanks again, Shelby. Oh. Hmm? oh, I was just, Adrian has a little turtle. <laughs> that, that was cute. Are you going to put me back on? Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, good class tonight. Uh, next week, we've got entomology with Dr. Rupesh Karyat uh, from uh, UTRGV. Uh, Dr. Goolsby was going to be the second half, and he has a flight that evening. And uh, between he and I, we were worried that he wasn't going to be able to make it back in time. So Tony is going to, Tony Reisinger is going to talk to us about the Bahia Grande restoration. And um, if you were out at the uh, Ecotourism Center, uh, that's the part, uh, it's right behind the Ecotourism Center. And it's a great story on what it, had become because of, because of the ship channel and then what it is now. So he's going to do uh, talk to us about that. 